Okay, pressing on uh, with the uh, Catholics, Evangelicals, and the Quest for Unity, the analysis of the Evangelicals and Catholics Together <clears throat> document that took place uh, back in the 1990s, and uh, things have not gotten better. They've gotten worse uh, in the church um, as more compromise and more apostasy and more um, false teaching <clears throat> regarding the gospel is tolerated, promoted, sold, and pushed. Um, let's go ahead and, and press on with this, uh, with part two. And I'd like to make some comments along the way, just like uh, last time. And now, beginning part two of the roundtable discussion titled Irreconcilable Differences, Catholics, Evangelicals, and the New Quest for Unity. Now, our program is about a document called the Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium. We're also going to be talking about a new clarifying statement that was just written by the evangelical signees of this document. You may not know, but the Evangelicals and Catholics Together document was written by evangelicals and Protestants and signed by 20 well-known leaders in the evangelical world and 20 well-known Roman Catholic leaders. Now Chuck Colson, who helped to draft this document, has acknowledged that it has caused a lot of controversy. And uh, he has admitted that it raised genuine concerns over whether this document clearly represents what evangelical Christians believe. So just a few weeks ago, we met with Chuck at his request. We had 10 evangelical leaders there. The four of us were there. And Chuck expressed his concern over the confusion the document has caused, the lack of clarity concerning what evangelicals believe. And he wanted to resolve and remove any contentious issues so that there would no longer be any doubt as to where he and the other Protestant signees stood. To this end, together we all composed a statement that clarifies and clearly defines our evangelical distinctives. Not all of them, but some of the primary ones. Now, Dr. John MacArthur, when we met together, we agreed that the ECT document, the Evangelicals and Catholic Together document, was attempting to join Roman Catholics and Evangelical Protestants together as co-belligerents, the word that Francis Schaeffer coined, working at the grassroots level in terms of social issues. And we were going to work together against the many social evils, including secular humanism, the rising tide of Islam, pornography, abortion, and things like that. But we also agreed that this work has been perceived as going too far in proclaiming the kind of unity that exists. And once again, it, all it did was create great division. Um, it didn't create unity um, because when Protestants negotiate theology with Catholics, we lose. Because in principle, they can't change their beliefs. Uh, they are absolutely fossilized into their beliefs. Their, their beliefs are... Uh, completely inflexible because they have exempted themselves from the possibility that they could be wrong. So if we sit at the table with them to discuss these things, to try to come up with a unified understanding, the only way that will happen is if the Protestants, if the Christians give up what they believe. Because Rome's not going to do that. And we, of all people, since we do know the gospel and we do understand um, the way of salvation. We should be the last ones to ever negotiate that away. And yet that's exactly what they did. That's what Chuck Colson and J.I. Packer and all the rest of them did. And that kind of thing is still going on today uh, with the Manhattan Declaration. There were a couple other documents that came out and they all are very, very, very clear in making sure they leave out the gospel because the gospel is the point over which everyone divides. And it's the, it's the one thing that we have to really fight those social evils. That's the, the incredible irony of all of it, is they sold away the one thing that can actually stop pornography and abortion and the rising tide of Islam and secularism, the gospel. You just gave away the only weapon we have to actually overthrow those things in order to fight them. How foolish. That's like, um, you know, I've been doing reading, or, um, uh, doing some studying on the uh, German war against Russia uh, during World War II. That'd be like um, the Soviets getting ready for a big offensive um, and then throwing away all their weapons and then just charging naked towards the German lines. Why would we do that? 
that that's not going to do any good to give away give away the only thing that we've got to fight these wars with, which is the gospel. It's it's just incredible to me that these men who should have known better would make such an incredibly foolish and God dishonoring mistake. I'd like to define the kind of unity that can exist between evangelicals and Roman Catholics and the kind of unity that cannot exist until the doctrine of justification by faith alone has been dealt with clearly. Well, uh, I might be a little bit radical on this, so, uh, <laughs> but I'll go ahead. I think the way we can work together on it is for the Catholics to work against those things like they want to work against them and we'll work against those things like we'll, we want to work against them, but we can't really we can't really throw our arms around each other in a common effort because that confounds the issue of spiritual truth. Thank you, Dr. MacArthur. Right on. So how can we work together with Roman Catholics to fight against abortion and to fight against pornography and the rising tide of Islam and secularism? We don't work with them. We can't. Because people that do that always want to talk about we're a united front, we're Christians together. Um, and we're going to take the gospel in there together. We're going to fight on the front lines together as fellow believers. We're not fellow believers because we don't agree on what the gospel is. And Rome's mountain of add-ons to simple faith in Jesus as the means of justification de-churches them and makes it impossible for us to fight against these issues with them. Now, I learned that lesson the hard way in Cincinnati trying to do pro-life work. Eventually, I had to distance myself from everyone, from both sides. From the Catholics, told them, I don't want anything to do with you. Protestants who were okay with doing stuff with, with Catholics on the abortion issue, I had to tell them to get lost too. I eventually told them all, I don't want anything to do with any of you. And I basically worked by myself with people from our church. And that was it. That was it. Because... They wanted to see it all as we're doing ministry together, we're all fellow Christians, and, you know, I got such compelling arguments from, from the heads of various ostensibly Protestant organizations. Oh, but they're so nice. <clears throat> not exactly, you know, not, not a whole lot of teeth to that argument. Um, my whole point was, if we don't agree on the gospel, we are not fellow Christians. If we don't agree on how we're made right with God, we don't, we don't have Christian unity. You can't unite around a social issue. The only thing that unites people is theology and doctrine, specifically how a person is saved and made right with God. That is the apostolic example that we're given in the scriptures. And it's amazing to me that so few understand that today. And pe people will quote from G.K. Chesterton and quote from uh, other Roman Catholic writers as if they're spokespersons for Christianity. Uh, shame on them. Anyone that quotes G.K. Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton was an apostate. He was a member of the Church of England and left it for Romanism and spent the rest of his life attacking the gospel. And Protestant reform guys will quote him as if he's a great theologian or something. It's terrible. It's, it's horrendous that people do that uh, and give off the impression that we are in some way united with Roman Catholicism. We are not. And I, I know that more and more and more I'm alone <laughs> in, that, in that assessment. Um, look, if the Catholic Church is already a co-belligerent, uh, if they're already anti-abortion and uh, pornography and homosexuality, they're going to use all of their energies within the framework of their system to, to go after that. Yep. We're committed to that and we're going after that. There's already a collective movement. Once you then sort of try to define that as common spiritual mission... Which is exactly what both sides do. They try to define it as common spiritual mission. Listen to, listen to John MacArthur. Build on common spiritual unity. You just take doctrine and throw it out the window. Yep, and that's what people do, and they don't care. They don't care. What we believe, our theology, our doctrine of the gospel, that is the only basis for real Christian unity. And these people can trumpet, we're united, we're united, we're united. They can do that all day long. But if they do not believe the same thing about, about God and about the gospel, th that is a lie. They're not united. And perception is, is, is violated, particularly because the Catholic Church claims to be true Christianity. And that's the problem. The Roman Catholic Church claims to be the only Christian church on earth, really. I mean, for centuries they did that. The Council of Florence in the 15th century 
uh, said that uh, schismatics, heretics, and Jews will not become participants in eternal life, but will depart this life into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then five centuries later, um, Vatican II comes along and says, well, 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 we'll tone that down a little bit and say they're just separated brethren. Really? Us he Protestant heretics and schismatics? So now we're not going to hell. Now we're separated brethren? That's just ridiculous. And they try to tell us that the, their doctrines never changed. Please. And when we reverse 450 years of history and just throw our arms around the Roman system, which I think we have to say, John, in all honesty, is not a group of wayward brothers, but is an apostate form of Christianity. It is a false religion. It is another religion. When you throw your mm -hmm. arms around that, you, you, you literally have to, to undo any doctrinal distinction. And in fact, East... That, that's why the Revoice Conference and having three Roman Catholic speakers and calling them fellow Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ, that undid the Reformation. You see, there's absolutely nothing loving about that. What's loving is to talk to them about the truth, about the gospel, and to, to point them to Christ alone as the all-sufficient Savior. There's nothing good that can come from acting like those differences aren't there, that we don't, agree, we don't agree on the gospel. There's no good and there's no love in pretending that those differences don't exist. And that was enough. That should have been enough um, for people to recognize this is a very, very serious sin that these men have committed by promoting this stuff, this ecumenical stuff with Rome. And yet it was, it was like hardly even part of anyone's reports on the revoice issue. Amazing. ET doesn't just do that implicitly, they do it explicitly. Mm -hmm. In the document, in effect, they say we have to accept all baptized Roman Catholics as brothers and sisters in Christ. And in an amazing? article that followed that up in Christianity Today, J.I. Packer said, we should acknowledge as brothers and sisters in Christ anyone who lives to the highest ideals of their communion. That just blows my mind. J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer, one of the best theological writers, the author of the book Knowing God, which is one of the best books I've ever read. He was saying this. He, like, went off the tracks. He went off the tracks and defended evangelicals and Catholics together. Just amazing how, how Packer, the guy who wrote the introduction to the death of death and the death of Christ, John Owen's great work, which people have said is so excellent it should be sold as its own little book. It just shows you. You can't have heroes um, that you basically ascribe infallibility to. Uh, even the very best of theologians and speakers and, you know, I, I really question the uh, propriety of having kind of like reformed celebrities. That's, that's, I don't think that's healthy. I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, who are itinerant and constantly crisscrossing all over the world. I don't think that's really healthy. Um, because people give too much to these people and let them get away with, with stuff that they shouldn't let them get away with saying. My response to that is the opposite. I, could, I maybe could fellowship with a bad Roman right. Catholic. One that doesn't believe the That is one right? who rejected the system but was still in the church and came to know Christ. But one who holds the highest ideals of Roman Catholicism, on what grounds do I have spiritual unity? Yeah, that's strange. In that Christianity Today article, Packer said that we should respect as brothers and sisters in Christ those who live to the highest ideals of their communion. Really? On, on what basis would I have fellowship with someone who, li who uh, holds fast to the highest expression of their community, uh, meaning they believe all of its dogmas. I mean, how can I have fellowship with someone who believes in purgatory? How can I have fellowship with someone who believes that, that justification is sanctification and that we get into heaven by congruent merit that we acquire through um, saying rosaries and going to mass and doing good works and, and taking pilgrimages and staring at some femur from allegedly some saint to get time out of purgatory? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We don't have spiritual fellowship with people that believe things like that. And when you get spiritual leaders from both churches coming together to sign a common effort, you may say it is to fight a cultural <coughs> war, but people are going to see it as confusion over doctrine. And that's exactly what, the way people did see it. They saw it as confusion over doctrine. How can you unite with people that don't believe the gospel? John, uh, can I say something yeah, about this? Yeah, let me, let, me, let me just throw in here. Uh, that's why we put in paragraph one in this new doctrinal statement, which let me read it. Our parachurch cooperation 
with evangelically committed Roman Catholics for the pursuit of agreed objectives does not imply acceptance of Roman Catholic doctrinal distinctives or endorsement of the Roman Catholic Church system. And yeah, that's important, John. See, and I, before we listen to Sproul here, but I, I, I want to point out, it doesn't matter if the people that hosted Revoice say, we're, we're not saying we agree with, with Roman Catholic theology, even though they, they do agree, embrace their doctrine of concupiscence, their doctrine of sin. Um, that sin consists only in actions and not in desires. It's both, obviously, from you look at scripture, Colossians 3, 5. Kakas epithemia, evil desires. We're told to put those to death, too. Even if we don't act on them, the desires themselves are evil. So the doctrine of concupiscence, um, the Roman Catholic concept, is wrong. Um, but anyway, what was I saying? The, the, point, the point being, the fact that they um, declared that these people are brothers and sisters in Christ is very clear evidence that what they're saying is, yeah, we, we disagree with them on certain things, but none of those things are, are game changers. None of those things are showstoppers. None of those things strike at the vitals of religion. If that's the case, if they really do think that, then there's no possible way they can believe the Westminster Confession. There's no way they can actually truly believe what it teaches about the gospel and how we're saved. That, they, that uh, Chuck and uh, Dr. Packer and Bill Bright uh, wanted to make that point clear. I just want to comment on John's statement that he, he prefaced by saying it was a little bit radical, you know, like being a little bit pregnant, I think. <laughs> uh, because when, when somebody representing evangelicalism makes the comment that in their opinion or their judgment, the Roman Catholic Church is apostate, it's not a true Christian community, in this day and age uh, of tolerance and pluralism and relativism and, and, and the uh, milieu of irenic, peaceful, gentle coexistence, we live in a world that's fed up with theological controversy and disputes and divisions and all of that. See, we don't live back in the 16th century where people burned each other at the stake over that. Mm -hmm. For John MacArthur to make a statement like that about the Roman Catholic Church, which is the largest uh, <laughs> uh, professing body uh, in, uh, in the world that claims a uh, Christian uh, position, it's just plain inflammatory, incendiary, and, uh, and will provoke a, a, a howling outcry <laughs> of people. Who, he's going to get an enormous amount of mail for saying that, John. You know that. You know, <laughs> and, uh, because it hasn't happened here um, in Tennessee, but there were there were folks at the church in Ohio that would get upset at me every time I said things like that about Roman Catholicism. Who would get uh, really upset um, that I said that Romanism was a false religion, um, and immediately they don't want to talk about the theology; they want to talk about individual people. And I, it was almost impossible to get people to actually focus. On, on issues of truth rather than the individuals that profess to, to hold to that system. Are you saying every Roman Catholic is going to hell? I am no more saying that than I'm saying every person in the PCA is going to heaven. What I'm talking about is the systems of doctrine that they represent. That's the issue. Not the individuals that are part of it. But if someone is a representative of that system, you are promoting that system. You can say, well, I know this guy doesn't actually believe this, 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 and that. It doesn't matter. He's a member in good standing of the Roman Catholic religion. What does that tell you? He represents that system. And if you're promoting him, you're promoting the system he represents. I want to know which is the punchline. What's the punchline is this, John, <laughs> that the one thing that, that the spirit of tolerance of our day cannot tolerate is intolerance. Because mm -hmm. relationships have become more important than truth. Reflect on that, please. Relationships have become more important than truth. How has the LGBT revolution made it into conservative churches? That, I will say, it has surprised me. I always thought, you know, if the PCA or, or if, if reformed churches were going to be overrun, it would be overrun by some kind of really subtle false gospel or something like like the federal vision or you know something like that um where people that um people would be more easily misled i didn't think it'd be the the gay stuff i, I never thought that uh, would actually make it in but what what has surprised me is the method that is working and i pointed this out i read matthew vines's book and i did a couple sermons on 
Matthew Vine's God and the Gay Christian, the, the biblical case in favor of same-sex relationships, which is one of the worst books I have ever read. Um, the, the criminal mishandling of the Bible um, is just is sh on every page of, of the book. Red herrings, begging the question, and okay, here's the method that works. And it's working, it's working on many people in PCA. Use really, really shallow, bad arguments. Like, for example, well, the man in John chapter 9 was born blind. And the Pharisees asked, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither. But for the glory of God, this person was born blind. It's the same way with people that are born gay. They're born gay for the glory of God. And as I've had to point out, and it shocks me that, that this would need to be pointed out, there's no parallel. No parallel between physical handicaps and homosexual perversion. None. There is no parallel of any kind between those two things. I mean, when Greg Johnson said at the General Assembly, we don't tell infertile women to, to conceive of themselves as fertile. We don't do that because being infertile isn't a sin. <laughs> it just blows my mind. We don't do this with any other handicap. There's no such thing as being a homosexual in the same category as, a, as being crippled. Or being in a wheelchair, or having a, or being blind or deaf, or something like that. That just amazes me. So, those are really bad arguments that should not work on anyone. No one should buy arguments that are that bad. So, really, 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 really bad arguments are working, and then you cement your case with emotion, and stories, and anecdotes. And then what those emotional anecdotes and emotional stories do is they shut down critical thought so that people won't notice how bad the arguments are. Now, I would never have thought that would work, but it's working. It is actually working. So there's a two-pronged approach. First, really bad arguments, terrible biblical arguments. Or arguments that no thinking Christian should ever even remotely consider. Use really, really, really bad arguments and then cement your case with emotion and anecdotes and emotional stories. And talk about people and friendships and relationships. Like, like RC just said, relationships have become more important than truth. One thing that RC has said is over this evangelicals and Catholics issue that happened, he lost friends right and left. Lost people. But you see, your love for Christ and for the truth and for the gospel has to supersede all other relationships. Including your wife and your children and your family. It has to supersede all. Everything. Luke chapter 14. Whoever does not hate his father or mother. Yes, even his own life. Also, he cannot be my disciple. So yeah, relationships have become more important than truth. And that is a crying shame. That is so sinful and wrong. Now, what's at stake here? If I understand the New Testament where the Apostle Paul writes to the Galatians and says, if anybody, anybody, if it's Peter, if it's Barnabas, if it's an angel from heaven, teaches any other gospel, let him be anathema. That's not Sproul, that's not MacArthur, that's not Kennedy, that's not Ankerberg. That is the apostolic position. And Paul wanted to make sure that he made himself clear, so he repeated that. Verse and then he goes on to say that he had to resist Peter himself. As Peter started to, to, to crack and compromise and negotiate the gospel. Now think about the people in the first century who got that letter. They were horrified. They said, oh, the last thing we can have happen is a breakup of fellowship and unity between Peter and Paul. Yeah, you see that? You see the application Sproul's making? He's right. The people in Galatia that got the letter thought, wow, the apostles themselves are having a fight over the gospel? Because Peter was starting to mm, knuckle in a little bit? I mean, may maybe Peter was saying, oh, I mean, th these Judaizers, they're such godly men. They're so godly. I mean, ser seriously, if you, could, if you could sit in church and worship next to so-and-so, this Judaizer teacher, this guy that came from James and said, yeah, in order to be saved, you also had to be circumcised. Oh, I mean, the love. He loves the Lord so much. He loves the Lord. And he loves his family and his wife. And he's so godly. He's looked up to. He's the, I mean, he's written books and, and manuals about how to, how to have a good marriage and stuff like that. 
I mean, maybe maybe Peter was starting to think like that a little bit. Maybe he was starting to, to compromise even on that level. And Paul said, if I myself come back and tell you something different, may I be damned. You see, what, what the priority is is always the truth of the gospel. That takes priority over everything. And people don't understand that today. People, Seminary graduates do not understand that today. And, you know, I think a lot of guys that come out of seminary, they kind of they can kind of have the impression that, you know, the Bible, can we really understand it? I mean, we can have our convictions. You know, I, I really am convinced that, you know, justification, we, you can't be more justified later than, you know, than you than you were at the, at the first moment you were justified. I mean, I think your justification is going to be exactly the same at the end. Okay, well, I'm glad you think that. Is that a conviction? Well, I, I mean, can, can we really say for sure that we have it all right? Could, is it possible we could be wrong somewhere? <laughs> Those are the kinds of things that people say all the time. You know, there was a, guy, a local guy um, that lives in town here that I did lunch with a few times that he, he used to send me emails and he'd be all upset at me for criticizing Arminianism. And I we met and wanted to talk. You know, he wanted to talk and we sit down to lunch and he had no interest in going to the text of scripture to talk about anything. He didn't want to talk about the Bible. He gave me Roger Olson's book uh, called Arminian Theology, Myths and, and Realities or something. Something like that. What's it called? Armini yeah, Arminian Theology, Myths, and I forget. Whatever. I can't remember the subtitle. But I suffered through the whole book. I read the whole thing. And I gave him the five points of Calvinism defined, documented, and defended by uh, Thomas and Steele. And I read the book that he gave me and came to, a, to lunch with the guy, ready to ask some questions. <laughs> and he came to lunch with my book and handed it back, unread. And I said, didn't you, you didn't even read the book? No. I'm like, what was the point? He started it. He reached out to me. I read your book, book and was ready to talk about it. He didn't want to talk about it. Didn't want to, didn't want to go to the, the text of scripture. And all he could say, all he could keep asking me, isn't it possible you could be wrong somewhere? I said, yes. So why don't you show me where that is? Why don't you demonstrate where we're wrong? I am all ears. Here we, I ha, have Bible, we'll listen. But isn't it possible you could be wrong somewhere? Yes, it's possible it could be wrong somewhere. Where do you think we're wrong? Tell me, where do you think we're wrong? And I, I am willing to listen to you. And if you can show me that I'm wrong, I will, will thank you for it. But we never, never would actually try to show me where I was wrong. It was just, weren't you open to the possibility that you could be wrong? So it's almost like they're really not trying to win you over to their position. What they want to win you over to is skepticism. No one can say for sure what's right and what's wrong. And that is not a, an appropriate attitude for a minister of the gospel to have. To be a minister of the gospel, you have to have convictions. You have to know what the gospel is so that you stand up and with passion and conviction say, that's wrong, this is right. And if, if we don't have that, if we're not sure, if we just have personal beliefs about the gospel instead of rock-solid convictions, this is what's true, we can't be ministers and we can't be elders either. All I've listened to for 10 months is, oh my goodness, what would happen if we saw a split among people like Colson and Packer and Sproul and, and, and MacArthur? We can't have that happen. Well, I'm the last person in the world that want to have that happen. I yeah, I, I, I don't like division. I don't like conflict. I wish every Presbyterian minister held to the confession and, and would say, are you out of your mind having Roman Catholic speakers at your church? What are you thinking? And promoting that as spokespersons for true Christianity? What is wrong with you? You cannot do this. I can't stand that either. These people are my friends, my comrades, and everything. But John, what he is saying here, the Catholic Church understood in the 16th century. At they do. Trent, Rome placed its unambiguous anathema on the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone and has never in any magisterial sense removed that anathema. Mm -hmm. The Roman Catholic Church condemns sola fide. And that ain't gonna change. And it's been that way since the gavel came down to close the final session of the Council of Trent in 1564. And that anathema has never been modified, deleted, changed, or softened at all. Now, if, if, please understand this, if sola fide is the gospel. Which it is. 
then the Roman Catholic Church has condemned the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody who went to the, to the uh, Council of Trent as a delegate went there with the intention of condemning the gospel. Of course they didn't. And, I mean, seriously, heretics and false teachers have never gone at their project of heresy and said, how can we deny the Christian faith and perish eternally? I mean, they always think they're right. They always think they're doing the right thing. But they're not because they're not, they're not believing what the Word of God says. And the attitude today is, who, who are you and your arrogance to think that you do know what the Word of God says? We believe in the perspicuity of Scripture. It is clear. When it comes to the gospel, it is clear. In fact, those who have taken vows to the Westminster Confession, uh, I think it's one, chapter 1 1.6, it says, Not all things in Scripture are alike plain in themselves, nor clear unto all. But those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded in one place or another that not only the learned but the unlearned, with, an, with the due use of ordinary means, may attain to a sufficient understanding of them. The Bible is clear. And the day that we say, oh, it's so arrogant to hold to something with such conviction that you denounce things as heresy, please listen to me. The strength of a man's convictions can be measured directly by how forcefully he denounces heresy. And if a man, if a minister is not willing to stand up and call Rome, one of, one of the, the most obvious forms of blasphemy and heresy on the gospel if they will not stand up and say that's heresy that's wrong they should not be in ministry period the theologians of rome really believed they were defending the gospel and that the protestants had in fact committed apostasy mm -hmm. and i admire the church the roman communion of the too. 16th century for at least understanding what apparently people don't understand today and that's what's at stake here they understood it. That they understood. They understood. Roman, Roman Catholicism understood what ministers today don't understand. Listen. That somebody is under the anathema of God. Someone is preaching a false gospel. It's us or Rome. But we both can't be right because we do not agree. We, our doctrines are not complementary. They are contradictory to one another. Contradictory to one another. And Rome, in the sixth session of the Council of Trent, anathematized justification by faith apart from works. They anathematized it. And we can be as nice and as pleasant and as gentle and as loving and as charitable and as tolerant as we possibly can be, but it's not going to change that, folks. Yep. And the other side, all they can say to us is, oh, you guys are so angry. Check your anger, brother. And I just want to say right back to the other side, check your indifference, brother. Check your indifference to the gospel being drugged through the mud in the name of Jesus being drugged through a sewer with all this LGBT stuff. Check your indifference to these matters. Somebody is preaching a different gospel. And when Rome condemned the Protestant declaration of justification by faith alone, I believe Rome, when placing the anathema on sola fide, placed the anathema of God upon themselves. They did. And I agree with his assessment. I do too. That the institution is apostate. It is. I don't want to leave Jim out of this, but I, I, I just, I, I think it's so important to know this. In a time like this of tolerance, listen, False teaching will always cry intolerance. It'll always say you're being divisive, you're being unloving, you're being ungracious, because it can only survive when it doesn't get scrutinized. Man, he is right. False teaching, false doctrine will always cry intolerance. It'll always say you're being divisive, you're being unloving, you're, you're not being caring. Fundamentalism and this harshness is a failed project and you guys are alienating people when you're not being loving. Why does false doctrine and false teachers, why, why do false teachers always do that? So that you don't scrutinize them. So you don't take a rational biblical look at what they're saying. The LGBT stuff, the arguments for it are very bad. Very shallow, very bad. But they're working. 
Because when we stand up and say, that's wrong, this is wrong, and here's where you're wrong biblically, and you're wrong here, and here's what the Greek says, and here's what the text of scripture says, we're told what? Our tone is bad. We're told that we're too mean. We're not being loving. You're being divisive. You're not being charitable. It's uncharitable. And so it cries against any intolerance. It mm -hmm. cries against any examination, any scrutiny. Just let's embrace each other. Let's love each other. Let's put all that behind us. False doctrine cries the loudest about unity. Mm -hmm. And listen carefully when you hear the cry for unity, because it may be the cover of false doctrine encroaching. And if ever we should follow 1 Thessalonians 5 and examine everything carefully, it's when somebody's crying unity, love, and acceptance. Yep. Yeah, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, not Chuck and not J.I. Packer and some of our evangelical buddies that came out with the ECT document, but others have gone one step further and have said, you know, evangelicals and Catholics should overlook doctrinal dis mm -hmm. differences and distinctives yep. and unite to survive today yeah. here in America. Yep, people are saying that. If too. we don't stand together, we don't fight together. We're all going down. How does that come into your theology of the sovereignty of God? Should we give up doctrinal distinctives just to survive? What do you think about that? Well, John, first of all, let me, uh, if I could, just add sure. one little thing to this uh, discussion that went on here. And then I'll get back to that. That's right. <laughs> uh, for those lay people here that are not familiar, the, the Council of Trent, 18 years, that they spent examining the, the doctrines of the Protestant Reformation. And at the end of that time, they came out with the many canons of the, of the Council of Trent. And this is the particular one that R.C. was referring to. And I'd just like to have you hear the words. This has never been altered or denied by yep. the uh, Catholic Church. Quote, if anyone says that the faith which justifies is nothing else but trust in the divine mercy which pardons uh, sins, sins because Christ of Christ, Christ. Yeah. or that it is trust alone by which we are justified, which is what every evangelical mm -hmm. Christian would say. Yep. And they end with, let him be anathema. I mean, that's just unbelievable. I still remember reading. The, the canons after the section on justification and reading through each of these, that's, that's actually canon um, 12. Listen to that. If anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that it is this confidence alone that justifies us, let him be anathema. So, if you believe the gospel, that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried and rose again, and that you're made right with God, that that justifies you before God. You are linked to Christ and are justified by your confidence in Jesus. You're going to hell. You are anathema, according to the Council of Trent, and according to every pope that has ever sat on the throne from the time the Council of Trent ended, um, from John Paul II with his ecumenical craziness, Benedict the Sixteenth and his German hardcore conservatism, and the hippie liberal Pope Frankie, um, and all of his bizarre, crazy statements that he made. He still affirms all these anathemas. I mean, Rome can purr all she wants and try to be conciliatory towards us and call us separated brethren, but the fact is, many, 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 many people were tied to stakes and burned and tortured to death by the Inquisitions over that doctrine. It's amazing how, how soon we forget um, the history. Which means, let him be accursed. Every evangelical Christian in the world stands That's under right. the official, never changed curse of the Roman church. Uh, and we need to be aware of that fact. And many aren't. And many, when they come to be aware of it, don't care. Don't care. The system that you're talking about says you are damned. Well, it's okay. We can unite with them against this, that, and the other thing. We can have them speak at our churches and tell everyone there that um, they're all children of the Virgin Mary. We can have a lesbian, Roman Catholic woman tell people that. And that's fine. How dare you say that that's wrong, you big meanie? I mean, that, that's basically all we've, been, all we've gotten in response. 
No one has actually tried to offer a defense of any of that kind of stuff. Now, I think that the Bible says we are to hold to the truth in love. Mm -hmm. Now, that's difficult to do. Only Christ ever did that perfectly. Mm -hmm. We always tend either to slip into a rigidity or a legalism or to slide down the other side into some sort of wishy-washy compromise of the gospel. Uh, But getting to your question, and that was one of the reasons for ECT, that we live, as Chuck told me on the phone when he called me, we live in a time when the very concept of truth is under attack, when the values and morals that Christians hold in common are under enormous assault, that we must stand together or we are going to fall together. But the problem with this document is it gives the appearance of compromising the basic doctrine of the gospel of the Bible, which is the gospel. And this is the heart of all Christianity. Yeah, and the Manhattan Declaration did the same thing. Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox people signed the Manhattan Declaration. The Manhattan Declaration says we proclaim our duty to proclaim the gospel of costly grace. We don't agree on what the gospel of costly grace is with Rome or with Constantinople. So how how can they say that? It gives the appearance that we all agree on that, and we most certainly don't. Facts are stubborn things. And this is why we, we had this meeting right here in uh, my office to try to work these things out so there would not be a schism among evangelicals and happily got all of these gentlemen to sign a statement that they do affirm the basic reformational truths. And they they signed a a statement that was external to ECT, which none of the Roman Catholic people signed because they wouldn't sign it if they presented it to them. I still would have difficulty uh, having my name on that document, which it is not, uh, because I, I think of the ambigu- uh, ambiguity of it. Ambiguity is the fortress of heretics. If you're always wondering, what's he getting at? What are they getting at? That's, a, that's not a good sign. Not a good sign. The lack of clarity and the way it opens a door for people to think there is no difference of any significance. Right. Yeah, th- people will say, We're, we don't endorse you know, everything Rome teaches. But those differences are not significant enough for us to say we can't have any kind of ecclesiastical fellowship with them. Um, that is being clearly communicated um, in the ECT document and with um, Revoice and having Roman Catholic speakers at your conferences. Pertaining to the gospel of salvation between Protestants and Catholics. I, I think, think it's, it's important. very important right now that we, for the people that are tuning in, because they want to know where do we stand right now? What does this doctrinal statement mean in terms of where are we at? That was uh, what I was going to address, John, but to, 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 so we have an understanding of this. The purpose of this meeting here for the clarification uh, was, as, as Chuck Colson had a passion, passionate concern to communicate, He said, can't we come together and agree to disagree as brothers in Christ? About the gospel? No. Can't we just agree to disagree? No. We can't. If you're going to betray the gospel, and you're going to say that the exclusion of works from being saved is not essential to Christianity, no, we can't agree to disagree. Because the controversy had escalated to such a point that the issue became now not what is the relationship between Catholics and evangelicals. But but what's the relationship between evangelicals that signed it and evangelicals that would never sign it? You see, all these attempts at unity, they don't create one new group out of two. They always create a bunch more groups. There's some that signed it and there's, there's individuals on both sides that would never sign it. But what will the relationship now be between evangelicals who endorsed this position and those who didn't? Are we facing a serious and permanent breach within evangelical ranks? 
I mean, was it necessary? I mean, are, are we going to break fellowship over our disagreement over ECT? That was what, uh, what provoked this. And at that meeting, everybody expressed their concerns in a candid way. And Chuck, of course, said, you know, that the whole thing was provoked in the first place because of their deep concern of what was happening in Latin America. And they didn't want to see another uh, Belfast erupt and trying to come to a, a united front against a, an increasingly hostile secularism. And we all said, hey, we share that concern. We don't but this isn't the answer. This is not the answer to that. I want to see uh, Latin America become a Belfast, and we recognize the hostility of secularism. Our concern was, as I stated in that meeting, as clearly as I knew how, that as far as I could see, ECT, in my judgment, betrayed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I also went on to say, and I've said this as loudly as I can every time I discuss this, I don't for one minute think that Bill Bright, Jim Packer, Charles Colson at all ever in their wildest dreams ever intended any such thing. But by the same token, neither did the signers of the Council of Trent. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, this was not a personal thing with me. Right. I was saying the document in what it says and proclaims, because it goes beyond this standing together as co-belligerents, it declares a unity of faith, John, where there is not a unity of faith. Yep. And that's what, that's what deeply, deeply concerns me. So what the concern of the men was at this meeting was to say, hey, look, let's say to the world, we do believe in sola fide. And Chuck Colson says, I... I believe in justification by faith alone, and he wanted to put, his, put on paper his, uh, his statement that this is central to the gospel of Jesus Christ, because he realizes that people were interpreting the document the way I was interpreting it, and he believed that that's a misinterpretation. Backer thinks that it's a misinterpretation. I think it's the, it's, it's the one that the document screams, but we still disagree yeah. on that. And, and Chuck is still committed to ECT. My fondest hope was that these men would remove their names from it, A, and if they couldn't do that, if they couldn't formally recant of it, B, that they would at least revise the document itself, and we couldn't get them to do that. Isn't that amazing? They would not change the document. You know why they wouldn't change it? If they changed it to have the word alone, remember the statement, we are justified by grace through faith because of Christ. That's not adequate. And it needs to be, we're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in, on account of Christ alone. Because if they modified the document, all of the Roman Catholics would have removed their name from it. At least, please give a clarification that we can print separately of what you meant. See, but if you meant something different than the other signatories, then you haven't actually got unity. You don't actually have, um, you can't unite around a statement that you interpret one way and someone interprets in a way that's contradictory to that. And in fact, that is to engage in lying. When you use equivocal expressions that you know the other side does not understand in the same way you do, and in fact they understand it in a way that's contradictory to the way you understand it, you're lying. That is to engage in misrepresentation of truth. There might be some people that are listening in and saying that's all fine and dandy in terms of what you guys are debating, but they picked up on some good things in terms of the relationship they might have with God. Take 45 seconds and close this with the good news that we think is so important, and how can the people that are watching get into it themselves? You know, I think the, the simplest way that I can say that is uh, God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Um, because he has ordained a day in which he will judge the world by that man whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus Christ. Um, there's, there's forgiveness for sin to those who repent. And it's, it's as simple as a beggar yep. coming and crying out for something. It's as simple as hungering and thirsting for a righteousness you desperately need, don't have, and can't earn. It, That's a great way of putting it. Desperately need, don't have, and can't earn. You need. There's a righteousness that's out there. There is a righteousness that you don't have, desperately need, and can never earn. And it's Christ's righteousness. 
And that's why we, we proclaim with such ferocity and passion that, that we are justified before God by believing the gospel alone. Because that unites us to Christ and the whole of our confidence is in what someone else has done and nothing in ourselves. No subjective transformation in ourselves at all plays a role in our salvation from sin and our getting into heaven and our justification before God. It's pleading with a gracious God to give you the forgiveness of your sins purely and simply because he wants to do it. It's a beggar's position. And if a person is overwrought with sin and feels the burden and the weight of sin and the heart anguish of sin, come to God, cry for mercy, and God in his grace will reach out and by virtue of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which satisfied his justice with regard to your sin, grant you saving grace. Yep. And now part three. Okay, we'll go ahead and, uh, and stop there. And so let's see, we are... 40 minutes and 52 seconds in and then we'll do part three um probably next week um, but i hope this has been helpful um these issues are still the same uh, they have not changed at all and uh, i hope that people will have will see that the roman catholic church is not um a group of, of christian <coughs> brothers and sisters but in fact is a mission field um and we need to, to <coughs> bring the true gospel to them and evangelize them so i hope that's been helpful to you thank you for watching or for listening